Hello, everyone. Welcome to Last Day's Awakening. I am Jimmy. I hope your day has been filled with the presence of the Lord. And um, even as you keep watch, following the commands of the Lord, command of the apostles, as you keep watch, you are experiencing the peace of God that passes understanding, which guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I trust that's where you are. With all that's happening, we have so much to talk about, particularly the fact that there is a bigger picture that we need to see because all eyes are focused right now on Israel. What will their response be? And as this is pre-recorded from its actual broadcast time at 6 o'clock in the evening central, what is it, daylight savings time? I don't know what it is. 6 o'clock. Israel may even now be responding to the attack, the attack of Iran that took place on Saturday night. So we're all watching. As many have said, and, and um, I, I echo this, I agree with this, as you look at Bible prophecy, you, you look squarely at Israel, and, and not only squarely at Israel, Israel being the hour hand, you look at Jerusalem as being the minute hand. Uh, you could even go <laughs> down to say that the Middle East is the, is the hour hand, and, and uh Israel is the minute hand, and Jerusalem is the second. And we are seeing things happen that are just amazing. Now, once again, you remember, guys, it was just, uh, wow, how many days ago? How many days before the, the attack took place was the eclipse that went over the United States of America? Oh, a nothing burger, they say. I, I am still convinced that that was a sign, if not the completing sign or the completing of a seven-year period. It's the final warning before the end of a seven-year period that was given to the United States of America in, in 2017. And uh, I'm convinced of it because now our country, our nation is in the balance, and I, I think it has found one thing. That's kind of a biblical usage, terminology, idiom. We are found wanting, and since that eclipse took place, we, we have seen the scales going toward the side of the anti-Israel, the anti-Semite, the turning against Israel. And so uh, the balance is weighed against us right now. Now, for the believer in Jesus Christ, we know our hope is not in our nation. Our hope is not in the government. The hope is not in our leadership. The hope is not in the president. The, the hope certainly isn't in the president. It, and it completely, in fact, if you look too intently and too, too deep into it, you'll find that the president really isn't in control. He's probably not in control of his own faculties, let alone the control of the nation. There's other other forces involved, spiritual forces of wickedness in high places that are involved in all of this, but ultimately it is God who is orchestrating everything that is taking place. As hard as that can be to fathom, the Lord is orchestrating. It's his chessboard. He is playing the pieces. He is playing all the pieces. The enemy may think he has the upper hand, but he does not. God is in control, and we see this from the prophetic word of God, exactly how this is going to play out. Now, we don't know all the details, which leaves us in a moment like this, like on this video right now, now, this momento, we're, <laughs> we're kind of in a, an educated speculation. I used to say an educated guess, but we're speculating as to what could happen next according to the Scripture. But there's a bigger picture here that is taking place that we need to remember. It's not just Iran and Israel. It is a bigger picture that is involved, because here's basically what happened on the night of that attack. You had, you had, and now it's come out, you had 
Joe Biden, probably Anthony Blinken more than Joe Biden, but you had the leadership of the United States involved in encouraging Iran to make the attack, to do the attack, and how to do the attack, so that there would be a retaliation by Iran that would not bring too much damage to Israel, but Iran would save face for the consulate attack that had happened the week before. And, and that's what it's all about in the Middle East. You have to save face. You have to show the upper hand. And yet, at the same time, the president is saying to Benjamin Netanyahu, don't respond. Count this as a victory because none of the missiles or so few of the missiles got through. There was very little damage and no loss of life and very few injuries. That's with roughly 120 ballistic missiles fired from Iran. Uh, that's with a hundred and maybe 150 drones launched from Iran, and roughly the same amount, 100 cruise missiles launched from Iran at Israel, and yet, and yet, it, nothing was penetrated really outside of just a couple of missiles on a couple of the uh, air bases, Ramon, and I uh, can't remember the other one, but. Uh, very little damage, did not take those air bases out of commission. And, and who was involved in all of that? Not only was Iran launching under the nod, approval, suggestions of the United States of America, government of the United States of America, the White House, the White Horse, the White House of the United States of America, but you had the defense systems, not only of Israel, David Sling, which was very interesting, the laser, the use of the lasers in outer space to shoot down the, the ballistic missiles, but you had Iron Dome knocking things down, but you also had the air defense systems of Jordan involved. You had the air defense systems of Saudi Arabia involved, the United Arab Emirates involved. You had the U.S. ships in that area shooting down drones, cruise missiles, ICBMs, um, or ballistic missiles, better said, ballistic missiles. And France was involved. Egypt was also involved to a certain extent. So you, you had all of these nations joining together with Israel to knock down, to put up the shield that would defend Israel, and then the encouragement of Israel, don't respond, count it as a victory, without understanding, without the understanding that in the Middle East, to not respond is showing weakness. Not only that, all of the defenses of Israel were laid bare. So how they defend themselves, and, and now with David's sling and all of it, it's all there. And $1.8 billion worth of munitions were expended by Israel in knocking down all of those projectiles that were launched toward it. There's a bigger picture involved. Interestingly enough, I believe this is more of a judgment against the United States, or it's a, it's a weeding out, a re revealing of the duplicity of our government, the duplicity of the White House, and not only the duplicity of the White House, but much of the government, both, both sides of the aisle in Congress, duplicit in how they are doing things, and you have... You have us on a march. You have, and I say you, not you guys, not you guys, but you, White House, have us on a march that is in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The United States does not appear in biblical prophecy. As close as you can get would be to connect the United States of America with the city Babylon. That's as close as you can get. Uh, there are passages in the scriptures that talk about Shinar, talk about uh, the city Babylon. 
in that area saying it will never, ever again, forever be rebuilt. Okay, so those who believe that everything's got to shift back to Babylon are not reading the scripture properly. It will never, never again be rebuilt. And yet the, the picture of city Babylon and then mystery Babylon, this religious Babylon, as well as city Babylon, are part of the book of the Revelation, and they will both be destroyed. Mystery Babylon will be destroyed by, by the Antichrist, by the beast that will rise up against the harlot on, you know, riding on the second beast. Mystery Babylon will be destroyed by the Antichrist. But the city Babylon will be destroyed in one hour. It's a different entity. That's as close as I can connect the United States of America. Pardon me, still having sinus troubles. But we'll live through it, you know? We will live through it. I can't wait until uh, the day of the rapture and I'll get a whole new sinus cavity. <laughs> oh, that's, I'm sorry. A little humor. But the bigger picture, I think, involves what is going on with those nations that sided with Israel. And, and there are those who keep looking at this and say, this is the multi-front war of Psalm 83, which I believe, used to believe, was a war, but I'm, I'm not convinced that Psalm 83 is a prayer that will be fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled around the walls of Jerusalem, and it is Armageddon that Asaph is actually praying for, it, and that's when it will be fulfilled. So we're not looking at a multi-front war right now. We're looking at all, people are saying, this is, the, this is Psalm 83 in action. No, because the, the elements of Psalm 83 are, uh, Outside of Gaza and Amalek, which, which you can see is Lebanon, outside of those two, Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia, Ishmael, Jordan being, uh, being Moab, and, um, and, and you had Saudi Arabia and the United Arab, Arab Emirates defending Israel, shooting down missiles against Iran. And Iran is not part of the Psalm 83 war, if that's a war. It's not part of it. It's not mentioned. So it, you're either going to be true to the Scripture, or you're going to read things into the Scripture. That's why Psalm 83... And I, I know this is a dead horse. In, in fact, some have stopped posting my videos on their telegrams because I, I came out and said... Ah, when you look at the scripture, Psalm 83 is a an imprecatory prayer that will be fulfilled at Armageddon. And it's not actually what I used to believe, an inner ring war. Most of that inner ring was actually defending Israel. What is going on? What is going on? So we're either going to stay true to the scripture or be as true as we possibly can to the scripture without reading things into it, or, or we're just gonna we're just gonna miss what God is doing. I think the bigger picture has to do with with bringing to light the duplicity of the United States of America so that it's not only in, uh, comes under the judgment of God, but it, it comes under the disdain of certain group of nations right now that are rising up to destroy it, comes under disdain and, and actually comes under a sense of justice to destroy the United States of America for its duplicity. And, it, and if it is Revelation chapter 18, pardon me, I'm rambling again, but if it is Revelation 18 and the city Babylon being destroyed, that happens because it has deceived the nations with its pharmakia, with its sorcery. It has lulled the nations with its seduction, with its goods, with the purchase of its goods, with, with everything that is, it has done to deceive. And boy, that's coming out of the woodwork right now, isn't it? The deception of the pharmakia, the sorcery. Of the deceptions that have come uh, out of our big pharma, and I have to be careful so that I don't get thrown off YouTube right now. But uh, it's very important that we understand there is a rising to the surface of of the righteous demand for justice. The blood, all of it, is rising to the surface, and so what's happening? And I, and I'm kind of kind of just speculating here, but part of what's happening between Iran and Israel is being co-authored, co-manufactured by a, by a bigger group of nations in order to bring about judgment against this 
nation that has dominated the world now for the last century, namely the BRICS nation. And we know that the BRICS nations are determined to replace the dollar, the fiat currency of the dollar, with a new currency that is governed by the BRICS nations. And the BRICS nations, which I'll talk about in just a second, but they were created to develop, uh, basically to form a block, an economic block for underdeveloped nations, nations that were developing, but yet cannot, for some reason, reach the level of the United States of America. And that includes China, too. Okay, so let's look real quickly at the BRICS nation. I'm going to do some scribbling, and in that scribbling, I'm going to do some speculation. I, I, that, I'm not going to leave out the scripture here. We're going to get to the scripture because I'm going to show you something from Jeremiah chapter 49 that I found very interesting and confirming. But let's talk about this first. The BRICS nations, the original five, Brazil. Russia, India, China, and South Africa. If you're from South Africa and I'm trying to use your accent, please forgive me. It's just fun to me. I just love different accents. Anyway, you have these as your principal five nations. We also know that they have made invitations to others and they have been accepted. Here they are. Saudi Arabia. They were to come in on January 1st. They delayed their entrance, but announced on January the 2nd their entrance into BRICS. Egypt was invited and accepted. Ethiopia. Now there's a developing nation, and uh, we've seen that before in Scripture. Uh, was invited. Oh, wait. Who else is here? Ooh. Iran is in the BRICS nations. Oh my, oh my, okay. And the United Arab Emirates, or the UAE for short. Come on, get the E there. Get the wings on the E. These are the nations of BRICS. These are the, wait, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, ten nations. Well, what have we here? Ten nations. Where have we seen the ten, ten nations? with ten kings and ten crowns riding on a seven-headed beast from Revelation 13 that rises up out of the sea. Whoa, wowza, wowza. Greek word, I think, wowza. But, but I want you to notice something. The, who is involved... And I'll, I'll just change colors here so that we, we get a little better understanding. Who was involved in helping to protect Israel against one of the BRICS nations? Okay, this is the one I'm circling. Iran attacked Israel. Who helped be- defend? Well, Saudi Arabia did. Well, Egypt did. Well, the United Arab Emirates did. Huh. And who is kind of running the show right now for all of BRICS? Russia and China. That's why that's why this whole picture that we're seeing is a bigger picture than just Iran against Israel. We know that Iran is going to be a part of a coalition that will come against Israel, and God is going to destroy that coalition. And so it's a singular battle in which God will do it. It is described in multiple places 
It also connects. Can, can believe I'm going to say this because I've held off on this for quite some time, but it also connects with the Battle of Armageddon. I've done research and since have found that others have done the same research. I just didn't see it before. Uh, but the research into Gog of Magog, not Gog and Magog, different, different scenario. Again, guys, different scenario. In Ezekiel, 38, it is Gog of the land. It's the land of Magog. In Revelation chapter 20, I believe it's 20, uh, or 21. I, I, should, I should do a real quick look here, because I, I don't want to misspeak here. But in the book of Revolutions, I've actually heard somebody say that here recently. The book of Re Revolutions talks about this. It's um, it's Revelation. It's Revelation chapter twenty. I was correct. That is the that is Satan himself. Not with not with help from anybody else, not fallen angels, not demons. They're all they've all been dealt with. Now Satan will come and deceive the nations and gather them together. Gog and that's an and and Magog together, and it will be destroyed by God. So fulfilled once and then fulfilled again. But the first one is Gog of the land of Magog. I had not intended to go this way, but here I'm going to do it. You, you can find these scriptures. You can see in the scriptures, if you study it, you will find that Gog is a descendant of Reuben. Grandson, in fact. Reuben is the firstborn of Israel. That's who Gog is. He is a Jew. But he's of the land of Magog. There's a whole history behind this. Magog is the son of Japheth. Whoa. Son of Noah. Whoa. He settled in the land of Magog, which is directly in the area of Ararat, all the way up to the Black Sea. So you could look at it as being parts of Turkey and parts of some of the stands. <laughs> That's all I'm going to do right there. That's the land of Magog. So what happened to Reuben? Well, Reuben committed an atrocity by taking one of his father's concubines, you know, one, one of the women that, <laughs> that gave him sons, Reuben took that woman. So he's not related to her because he's from, I think, from Billa, and, and, but it was the other one, okay? And he, he lied with her. He lay with her. He had relations with her, had, a, had an affair with her. And Reuben lost the birthright. And his son, Joel, the father of Gog, left the area, and the tribe of Reuben lost, uh, lost a clan. And that clan moved to the land and settled in the land of Magog, and it's been there ever since. And, and so not only is it the Turkey and Stands, but you're looking at the northern area of Syria. Wow. And I never studied this book. I just always believed that Gog was Putin, or Gog was somebody from Russia, and that Gog is Russia, and that the land of Magog is Russia, 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 and all of that involved in Russia. Uh, do I think Russia is duplicit in all of this? Yes. But during the tribulation, Gog is going to reveal himself. He has to be. 
he has to be accepted by the Jews. And, and by the way, they're all part of the same Mediterranean empires. I think I'm going to spell this totally wrong. Iranian. Okay, it's totally wrong, but they're all part of the same constant <laughs> Mediterranean empires over and over again that rule the area of the Mediterranean and its surrounds, and Syria is part of that. It was is part of the original part of Babylon. It was part of, you know, part of that area that was ruled by uh, the Medo-Persians. It was part of the, the area ruled by Greece and part of the area ruled by Rome. It will be part of the area and is part of the area that will be ruled again by the beast of Revelation chapter 13. So you see an economic picture, but you also see a Mediterranean picture. And there's got to be someone who will be accepted by the Jews. That person is going to have to be Jewish. But I want you to know, Reuben, Joel, Gog, the scripture says, that Antichrist personality will not worship the God of his fathers. It'll be a foreign God. So you're talking Islam. Oh my goodness. Is involved. So a Jewish, a Jewish Muslim. Wow, I'm making a mess here. Let me move. No, not move it away. Let me move it up. So you have Iran up here that will be part of Ezekiel 38, 39. You have Turkey. Okay, this is this is Gomer Togarma. Right? And you have Iran Persia. Oh wait, there's Ethiopia or Kush. That was a huge empire. Let's call that Kush. Along with Sudan. Kush, not Kash, Kush. <laughs> right? And, and you have you have Gog leader. He's the leader. It's the person leading this empire. You also have Libya. Um how do you spell Libya? Libya, which is put. Huh. Wow. You have Gog. Iran is right now, and so is Turkey, trying to push a caliphate. So this thing against Israel is not just a, uh, you know, who's, a, who's the bigger, the badder of the area. It is... It is ultimately the continual struggle between Ishmael and Isaac for dominance, for dominance over the inheritance or the covenants of God, including the land. The land is a covenant. So this, this can't be a divided Palestinian slash Israel two-state solution. It cannot. It cannot be. It cannot be. It's either Isaac or it's Ishmael. It cannot be both. This was given to Isaac, and so Ishmael's trying to push for it. So Iran is doing everything it can to control and rule a caliphate that they want to arise, not only area, but a world caliphate. They believe their Mahdi will come and rule, and he will be accepted by the Jews, and here we go, right back to this person, Gog, who is a Jew, but he's also Syrian. Scripture says that the Syrian, this, the, the, this persona, this Syrian, this picture of the Antichrist, which is also a picture of uh, a restored, not resurrected, but... Uh, the typology that is used with Antiochus Epiphanius when he commits the abomination of desolation to Israel. There's another person that will come in his, as him, all right? He's going to be, he's a figure, a precursor, a figure of the Antichrist who is to come. A Syrian, but a Jew who will claim, who will claim the birthright of Israel. 
in in the time of trouble. He will come. He will deceive. He will convince Israel that he's the one. He will bring them into covenant. And he will do it as a Muslim, yet Jew. And he will bring peace and security. Amazingly, this Antichrist figure, this other Christ figure, he he's part of, he's part, okay, okay, let's look at it this way. Jesus, he is fully God. So he is the representative of God to bring about reconciliation. But he's born of a virgin. He is fully man. He is the second Adam, right? So that he is the representative of mankind to bring about reconciliation. Happened by his blood on the cross. Antichrist, this other Christ, Right? He's going to be fully Jew. Is he going to be fully Muslim? That's the question. To bring about, to bring about a false temporary covenant reconciliation. Uh, let, let me just cross it out. Peace and security between Jew and Gentile, between, between Jew and Muslim, right? They will get their temple. He will get his place, his seat that he will eventually take, his throne. I know I'm off the page here. Let me get it up here. There you go. He will get his throne, right? This God that is unknown to his fathers, to, 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 the, to the fathers, you know, to this Jew is worshiping a God. He's given over to a God of war and violence. He's given over to a God that is unknown to his fathers, right? Because Islam was not in existence in the days of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The seed of it was there in history Babylon. The seed of it was there in the worship of the gods, and particularly the moon was all there in Babylon. Okay, so so what am I saying? I'm saying bricks. Bricks seems to be in its desire to rule the world with its own currency, with its own power, and its own economic strength seems to be um uh, the the structure it seems to be the framework it seems to be the scaffolding by which will rise the one who will bring about peace and security i don't believe it's the united nations that but they're crying peace and security right when they say peace and security sudden destruction will come upon them from first thessalonians chapter 5 so we see all that happening but What we're seeing are, is the walk-up. We're seeing the step-up to this. What is Israel going to do with Iran? Well, we, we kind of have to see. They're going to have to respond. They may even be responding right now during this video. They're going to respond. How are they going to respond? Well, there is the million Bitcoin question. Is it not? I want to go to the prophecy against or the judgment against Elam. And I'll show you something here in just a second, but let's read this first. This is this is all over YouTube right now, so I'm not I'm not declaring anything new. I'm not I didn't discover this. Uh, you know Bill Silas is the one the first one that came up with this. He also came up with Psalm 83. I think he's wrong on Psalm 83, but that's okay. I love him. This is not a salvation issue. We're going to find out who's right or who's wrong. I'm not in it to be right or wrong. I'm in it to say this is the time to watch. All right? There's a bunch of people doing incredible work and have been doing incredible work. And it, it, some we're going to be wrong at, on some things. Right? You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw the baby out at all. Just throw out the dirty bathwater. Whatever doesn't work or whatever is proven to be not right, throw it out. It's okay. We're in this. <laughs> we're in this 
this, uh, as uh, Repo Man 64 says, Mike says it this way, we're all putting together pieces of the puzzle. This has been going on for quite some time, but now there's a, a fervency about getting the puzzle pieces in the right place because we know our time is short. We know that that day is approaching it's rather quickly. But let's let's look at this. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam. Get that over just a little bit. I uh, can't quite get it there. Okay, let, let me let me do some mechanics. Gonna do a little bit of mechanicing, just so that you can see that whole page. All right, there we go. Elam, Elam. You now know this. You've seen maps of it. Elam is the southwestern portion of what is modern-day Iran. Back then, Elam was the southwestern area of that area of the Medes and the Persians. Okay, So Elam was huge, and this is a prophecy against Elam that, as far as we know, has never been fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled, and, and the mechanics of it are quite, quite interesting and appears to be uh, on the cusp of being fulfilled. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow. What does a bow do? It sends arrows. Okay, so now we've got a picture of missiles, uh, you know, an area where there's missiles that are predominantly <laughs> shot. I'll break the power, the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. That whole area of Elam in Iran, southwest area of Iran, holds two of their nuclear plants, uh, Bushwar and Natanz. Isfahan is just outside of the area of Elam, but you could probably include it too. And I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. Once again, this, this isn't a picture of something coming from heaven. This is a, an idiom talking about it's going to be a multi-directional attack. It's going to be a multi-directional attack, and it's going to be like a whirlwind from all four corners, right? Elam, the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, north, south, east, and west. That's what it means. And I will scatter them to all those Wind. So he's not going to scatter them to heaven. See how it's not heaven? It's the four corners. So if you look in context, you'll be able to determine what this is actually saying. It's going to be a multi-directional attack that will come, I believe, at the hands of Israel. I don't think the United States will participate. But if it does, then it's basically uh, showing itself to the BRICS nations that it must be destroyed because it's going to defend Israel and it's going to defend its own place in the world, and that place in the world has to be removed pretty much for the beast to rise up as a one-world government. Follow me here. Follow me here. I don't think the United, the United States is actually going to do anything because we are duplicitous. We're helping Iran. We're supplying them. We've given them $16 billion here recently. We're, we're funding them. We're funding this whole thing. We're duplicitous. We're deceptive. We being a general term, okay? We being a general term for the government, all right? And I will scatter them to all those winds. Those air, they're going to leave. They're going. The people are going to have to leave. Why? Because if it's a a multi pronged attack that attacks the nuclear facilities as well as the uh, nuclear processing sites, some of them are up in the mountains near Tehran, but a lot of them are in the area of the nuclear facilities, right? With their, their enriching of uranium deep underground, all of these things are in the, much of them are in the area of Elam. And so these attacks will come, and it's going to contaminate the air. The people are going to have to get out of Dodge and get out of the do of Dodge quick. And so they're going to be scattered. The enemies, therefore, are going to be scattered before the enemy, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger declares the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them, right? And I will set my throne in Elam and destroy their kings and officials, declares the Lord. Okay, what does that mean? We know that Iran is going to be part of 
that Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. It works either way. If you're talking about one of the first wars of the tribulation period, it works there, but more powerfully, it works as bringing them to Armageddon. So Iran is not going to be eliminated, but the area of Elam is going to be scattered. But I want you to see something here, too, that the Lord is going to do this to take down the leadership of Iran and, and make them inert for a few years. They're going to be inert until they rise up again in the Gog of Magog, the Antichrist coalition. My opinion, and many others are coming to the same conclusion and have come to the same conclusion because of who Gog is in Scripture. But in the latter days, in other words, towards the end of this, I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. So you're looking at the people who have been scattered to the nations are eventually going to go back to Elam and their fortunes are going to be restored. How in the world can that happen? The millennial reign of Christ. That's my opinion. Okay, so this is right before us right now. This is right before us right now. The rapture doesn't have to happen for this to take place. We could actually be seeing it right now. We, we could be seeing it right now. That, that's not to take away from the fact that I believe the rapture is absolutely imminent. How can you say that if it's at an appointed time? Well, the rapture, catching away... <laughs> is appointed by God. Whenever it happens, it's appointed by God. I still lean towards this coming Hebrew calendar Passover, right? Whether that's the right one or not, whether God's using a wrong calendar because he hates their feast days, and I think that's actually what it is. Um, we're, we're coming up on it, right? But look what else is in this chapter 49. A reaffirmation. This is after Isaiah's prophecy, but this is a reaffirmation on the destruction of Damascus. Here it is, right here in Jeremiah chapter 49, concerning Damascus. Hamath and Arpad are confounded, for they have heard bad news. They melt in fear. They are troubled like the sea that cannot be quiet. Damascus has become feeble. She turned to flee, and panic seized her. Okay, so why? Why is Damascus feeble? Well, Damascus is two-thirds destroyed right now because of the power of Iran, because Iran is in control of everything, and Israel has been defending itself and attacking Damascus because of their puppet, their puppet regime in Syria, but also because the, the Iranians control Syria, right? So it's feeble. Panic has seized her. Why? Because they're is it because of what happens in Elam? Elam's prophecy is just a few verses down, down the chapter here, but um, you know, he's, he's not saying they happen at the same time, but it certainly appears that this is a confirmation of what's coming against Damascus, but Damascus is going to get really weak need because of what happens in Elam and the power of Iran is, is uh, made inert. Inert nuclear materials, okay? It's made inert for a period of time, roughly, I think, seven years. She turns to flee, and panic sees her. Anguish and sorrow have taken hold of her as a woman in labor. How is the famous city not forsaken, the city of my joy? Therefore, this is what she's crying. This is what the, the inhabitants of Damascus are crying. Therefore, her young men shall fall in her squares, and all of her soldiers shall be destroyed in that day, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad, which is another word for the, the leadership of Damascus or the power of Damascus. And that fits with Isaiah chapter 17. It fits tremendously with Isaiah chapter 17. We're on we're on the cusp. Oh my goodness. We're on the cusp of seeing these things happen. Oh, it's right in front of us. So you have the BRICS nations 
including Iran, playing both sides, Iran and the United States. Why? To bring about a true picture of where the United States is going to fall. And it will fall. In God's eyes, the betrayal of Israel is the certain death nail. It, it's the death warrant has been signed on the United States of America. I believe the eclipses were the warnings that this is coming, coming soon. But the BRICS nations are doing everything they can. We also see, we're seeing the, the World Economic Forum faltering a little bit because the world's waking up to their attempt to take over the world. Does that mean it's going to stop? No, but I think the BRICS nations seem to be the ones that are going to rise up and take over the world. Probably using the pattern of the World Economic Forum, but wow. And I've been saying this for quite some time. We're seeing entities vie for the position of becoming the beast that rises out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13. I believe the beast that rises up from the earth is already, is already there. The framework is already there with, with, uh, with Rome. I just say it. Mystery Babylon already absorbing into Mystery Babylon and uh, recognizing Islam and, and Buddhism and Hinduism and every other ism out there as being viable ways to get to God. In other words, the incorporation of all religions into one, the syncretism of, of all religions into the Catholic faith. Sorry if you're Catholic, I, I don't mean to offend you, but it's, this is prophesied in Scripture. So that one is already there. It hasn't risen up to help yet the beast because the first beast hasn't risen out of the sea, but it's bubbling under the surface it's warring under the surface. It's fighting position for position under the surface. It's going to rise up, but something has to be removed before it can, and that's the restrainer of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that which restrains. This beast cannot come up, cannot come up fully into place, and nor can the little horn of Daniel chapter 9, chapter 7, whatever chapter it is. I'm in excited mode right now, so... The little horn's going to rise up and devour three. That little horn, being the Antichrist, is that Gog I'm leaning that way. I'm not going to be here to find out. Are you going to be here to find out? Please don't be here to find out. Strainer has to be removed. So, when they start crying peace and safety, and they do what they're going to do, sudden destruction is going to come upon them, but we're not of that night time. We're not of that darkness. We are of the day. We see it coming. We are not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation, deliverance, rescue. I've done word studies on that right here on this channel. We are devoted for rescue. Psalm 18, he drew me out. He delivered me, drew me out of many waters. And multiple word forms are used from nakak to lakak to all of these words that are used for pulling out, drawing away, escaping, drawing out. It's all, that's us. That's us. So we're on the cusp. We're on the cusp. When? I don't know. But um, I'm not anxious about it. Nor should you be. Our, <laughs> my wife and I were visiting, I don't know, we were eating lunch which since we're both on Weight Watchers right now, that generally includes chicken. So we, we get our chicken and uh, we eat our chicken and we put it on, we put it on chicken. And uh, then we uh, dip the chicken in chicken. Why? Because chicken has no points. We're losing weight. All right. Little side note. But we're, we're, we're eating our chicken with whatever. <laughs> Talking about it. Okay. So if, if we see, if we see, since the eclipse, if we begin to see the probability of a nuclear attack on the United States of America, what are we going to do? And, you know, my stance ever since I lived near the um, Minuteman missile silos out in western Nebraska, so you had Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, that whole area covered in Minuteman missile silos. Since that time, we lived a half mile away from them. Since that time, it, my stance has always been, if those missiles go off, I'm going to go out and get on my roof, and I'm going to watch 
as many of them go because it's fascinating to me, but it's not fearful to me. And uh, knowing that that whole area would be attacked and we would be vaporized immediately. So guess what? We get to go home. That's still our stance. That's still our stance. The United States of America comes under nuclear attack. So what? Yes, people are going to die. That's what we don't want. We want people to come to Jesus now before it's too late because many are going to perish in those moments. That's what weighs on our hearts to get the gospel to as many people as we possibly can and actually see them come to Jesus, not just have a head assent to the gospel, but to believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead and be saved. That's our desire. That's what we want. But as far as our life on this earth, the attachments are cut. The attachments are, are cut. However we go home, we're ready to go home. By rapture or by rupture, I <laughs> do we're ready to go home. And our goal is to take as many people with us as we possibly can. And we're not seeing that many people come to Christ. Preaching the truth, preaching the straight word of God, preaching the truth. People don't want to hear the truth. And yet the church is still growing wherever the truth is being preached. It's just not growing by leaps and bounds like the watered-down Gospels are growing. I don't mean to make a commentary there. Again, I'm rambling, but I just want you to understand, don't, don't be tied to this world in any way, shape, or form other than doing your mission, fulfilling your mission, and sharing Jesus Christ, because time obviously is short. And uh, this, this thing uh, could very well launch into, um, into action with the response of Israel, and they will respond. They will respond to Iran, and they, they will respond eventually to blowing out the nuclear plants and, the, and the, uh, many of, there's many of the processing plants and the infrastructure that is found in Elam. They will, they will do that and, and wipe out as much of it as possible. And I believe that will be the fulfillment of the first part of the prophecy against Elam. Final being just before Armageddon. Okay, where we are, I put a lot into this that I hadn't intended to, but you need to see the bigger picture. There's a bigger picture happening here. Our bigger picture is up. Look up. Look up. I actually physically look up, right? I'm always looking up. But I'm also looking out, because the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up. Our pods are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yeah. I hope you're encouraged in the peace of God that passes understanding is guarding your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Receive it, right? Lay your concerns, your anxieties, your supplications, and all your prayers and requests on him and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And I'm pretty well convinced, my friends, that we can do that very thing. We can do what's before us. Why? Promise. Yeah, I hear you saying it already. Philippians 4.13. Yep, you got it. Yep. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Father, add your power and your strength. May we be emboldened and empowered by the strength of your great might. As it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strengthened with your great might. May we be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to do what you've called us to do until we're called out of here. Help us, Lord. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory. Can you all say, yes, a double A man. Amen. God bless you all. Listen, I don't know. This may have been my last broadcast. I don't know. I hope so. But if not, we'll see each other again soon. If not here, where? In the air? Look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. And by the way, Jesus loves you. I do too, even though I don't know you. But he knows you. So, man, he's got you. He's got you in his palm, on the palm of his hand. He's got you.
God bless.